everything and everything that had to part. Kissed her goodbye at the train. Never heard from her again. Got a wire from a friend of mine out there. Told me of his marriage to this girl so fair. She's there to forget that we ever met when she once gets away from you. I just got a letter from that girl of mine. Says she's separated from her valentine. And she had the nerve to say she would be mine any day. Coming to you from the Central Library in downtown Los Angeles this time, I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. Today I'm not sitting down, but standing up with Josh Kuhn, professor at the uh, University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and he's also the curator of Songs in the Key of Los Angeles, which is not just an exhibition here at the library, not just a book, which you've probably seen, not just recordings. It's a lot of things. What, what, what is it? First off, hi, Colin. Hey. Uh, and I want to just make sure that folks know that I'm actually the co-curator of this exhibit mm-hmm. with Ina Arzamanova, uh, who uh, is a scholar and writer. Um, and uh, we're very, very honored to uh, be able to put together um, this, this small but mighty exhibition here on the first floor of uh, the Central Library downtown. And what have you put together here? Well, we, we basically, this, this is a... Um, an exhibition uh, based on the sheet music collection of the Central Library uh, within the Los Angeles Public Library system, uh, but also inspired by it. So it is both um, uh, some some key examples of sheet music covers uh, that are connected to kind of key narratives in the history and development of Los Angeles, uh, but also uh, using those sheet music covers to explore the library's relationship to music history. Uh, so things will, we'll, as, we, as we stroll around, uh, I think will come, you know, will come to light. But it's really meant to be an exhibit that uses sheet music as a way for people um, to think about the musical history of, the early musical history of Los Angeles. Now, how early are we talking about? This is a century of music, sheet music covers, right? Yeah, so... So the, the sheet music collection of the LA Public Library, the, the, the whole collection uh, is actually over 100,000 pieces mm-hmm. of both individual uh, sheet music pieces and songbooks. 
um, the Southern California Sheet Music Collection, which is the one that two years ago um, I and a group of my students came in and started to kind of assemble within the larger collection, um, dates roughly from the 1840s and up through around 1960. We cap it at 1960. It could go up to the present moment. But for the sake of curating the collection, we ended it there. Um, and so this exhibit does not go back to the 1840s, but, but, but does have some 19th century stuff in it, um, but really is probably uh, uh, best thought about as being kind of heavy in the teens and 20s, um, with some focus on the specific role of downtown Los Angeles as an early uh, music and entertainment hub um, in L.A. Was this, the, I'm just taking a quick glance before we look individually at these ones, but wait. Was this the heyday of sheet music covers? I feel like sheet music covers are not like a known thing generally outside of music scholars these days. But, I mean, looking at these, and I'm sure you picked the cream of the crop, but it had to be like a golden age of design for sheet music covers. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at sheet music covers now, no one's designing sheet music covers like this anymore. In fact, that's part of the reason we stopped this particular segment of the collection at around 1960 is that it's roughly in the 60s that sheet music design uh, starts to take second uh, or, or, or third uh, a seat to um, you know the main commodity at hand, which is recordings. So in the early days of the music industry, the first big you know the first way to um, sell music to commodify music was not in the recorded form, but in the printed, published form of sheet music. So as you might imagine, if you're comp- if, if, if you're competing with other companies to get songs out there. You got to market them, and you got to create one more dazzling cover. You know, each cover more. Buying them on a shelf, hard to picture these days. Exactly. You know, so it's the so you 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 want something that jumps off 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 the rack of your favorite music store, Uh, and you know, as you can see, these are some pretty gorgeous, um, you know, pieces of portable. Uh, domestic art. This stuff lived in people's homes. It sat on their pianos. It was in their living room. Right. So the display case is right there. It is yeah. what you play Abs- it on. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Where best to begin in this room? You know, we're in one of the two rooms in this hallway. Oh. Where, where do you like to start, I guess? Or where, where, now that you've, I mean, you've, you've spent some time with these. Yes, I have. Given that, yes, where I would have. you go first? You can't, you can't go wrong, actually, but maybe um, since, um, you know, the focus here is, of course, on Los Angeles, we could start actually with the latest um, second latest piece now in the collection, um, which is this song called Angel Town, um, which was a song written by Jay Livingston and Ray Evans, who were two uh, prominent Hollywood songwriters. Uh, and the cover of this, as you can tell, um, you know, is, is quite wonderful. It's a couple um, who, to me, look like they're kind of dressed in something right off a Hollywood backlot or something. <laughs> yes. You know, overlooking it could be a still frame of, of a Hollywood movie. Th- that's right. Um, you know, overlooking. Uh, uh, what looks to be kind of untouched, unspoiled, um, natural Los Angeles. The age of Edenic Los Angeles. Yes, exactly. And yet this is 1959. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that there's a kind of contrast or conflict between this continued desire to view and promote Los Angeles as a natural Arcadia, Mm -hmm. um, even while celebrating it as a a growing, sprawling, bustling urban center. Um, And this song, interestingly was the idea of an L.A. Times columnist, Gene Sherman, who in his City Side column uh, in the 50s started lamenting week after week that there was no song that truly, he thought, captured the essence, the heart of Los Angeles. Did, did other American cities have songs, longer established American cities? Yeah, well, in his mind, um, in his mind, uh, a place like Chicago, for example, mm-hmm. or New York, there were pop songs that, that people knew that had Chicago or New York in the title. Mm-hmm. So he was wondering, where is that L.A. song? Mm-hmm. Um, of course, what we found is that he just didn't know about a bunch of songs that, uh, you know, from, from as early as the um, uh, 1876, there were songs about Los Angeles. In, that's like kind title. of a Los Angeles thing, isn't it? To think there's nothing, yes. there's the thing you're looking for isn't here, but then there's actually dozens of the things you're looking for. Yes. You just didn't look hard enough. In, in fact, yes, and, and I actually believe that you know probably 10, 15 years from now, someone will say the same thing about me and this project, <laughs> which is which is great. It's part of that continuum of constant discovery. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly, the sheet music reveals these kind of layers of what so many scholars have written about as the kind of trend of amnesia um, within mm-hmm. Los Angeles history and the, the kind of convenience of forgetting certain things and establishing new ones, be it a strip mall um, uh, or a new identity or something else. Um, So Gene Sherman said that, um, you know, he wasn't going to wait for somebody to write a song, so he went and commissioned Livingston and Evans 
to write this tune, Angel Town. Um, and it became, uh, among other things, it became the, the official song of the Dodgers at one point. It was the official song of the Los Angeles Angels at one point. And as far as I can tell, it still remains the official song of Los Angeles. It was made the official song of Los Angeles in the 1960s. Um, and uh, I don't think anyone uh, repealed that. No one remembers it, but <laughs> but speaking of amnesia, uh, so it's still there on the books. How many of these songs are or were forgotten versus, or how many weren't forgotten? I guess maybe that's the more revealing question. It, it's it's always a, t a, a tricky question to answer because, of course, it's forgotten by whom and who's there to do the remembering. So there's always a politics of memory, and, and I think when we were doing this project, we were very aware of of um, words like discovery and 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 indeed the politics of remembering and forgetting. Um, that said, I think that there, are, you know, the, there's only a, a small number of the songs in the Southern California sheet music part of the collection um, that have existing commercial recordings. Mm -hmm. So one could guess that there aren't many recordings of there, that there weren't many recordings made of this music. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a result of that, a lot of the sheet music has kind of faded out because people cared less because the songs didn't become popular or something like that down the road. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say that there's, you know, there's some recognizable tunes here, like California, Here I Come, that we're standing in front of now. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's, there's songs like a Dear Old Hills of California or A Sunkissed Cottage in California that um, I think it's fair to say if you polled most people right now, they wouldn't know these songs. And in putting this project together, I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I spent a lot of time reviewing existing scholarship on Los Angeles, uh, the history of Los Angeles popular music, and with very rare occasions, most of these songs never appear and never crop up. How many of these are so we mentioned some titles, I'm looking at the Arcadian scenes, you know, they're all yes. they're very glory of Los Angeles centric. How many of these are just out and out boosterism? What are their origins in boosterism? A lot. Uh, uh, I, I can't trace uh, in most cases, I can't trace direct connections to Chamber of Commerce booster campaigns or real estate campaigns, but certainly up through Angel Town in, in 1959, these were songs that were meant to sell the city, um, or at least promote the city, or encourage you uh, if you if you if you if you if you've left Los Angeles, um, if you've left Los Angeles. Uh, to come back to Los Angeles, um, if you've never been to Los Angeles, to come to Los Angeles, uh, they, you know, they were songs that that, that tried to um, pitch the uh, alleged glories of L.A. and those alleged glories line up pretty nicely with most booster language. This is a sunshine, you know, sunshine and oranges uh, paradise where if you're sick, uh, if you're an invalid, if you're an infirm, um, you come to Los Angeles. If you're lonely, if your heart's been broken, come here, you'll fall in love. Um, if you finally want to have a, a house of your own, um, no. then come on to Los Angeles where you can, there's plenty of land, this is the wide open pioneer ready west and you can uh, put some stakes in the ground and claim some land as your own now a lot of this stuff was complete myth um, but it became a kind of reality of promotional vernacular that helped build LA How 
people hear these songs? Well, you would play them. Uh, Anybody who was going to hear them was going to play them themselves. They were going to play them, uh, and, you know, in some cases they might make their way into, uh, into local, uh, let's say, vaudeville performances or something like that. But for the most part, these were songs that would be played at home or played in uh, 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 specific performance venues uh, in minor public venues. Uh, but in rare cases, songs that, uh, you know, the, the songs that became closer to what we might think of as hits were songs that became well-known in vaudeville and you'd go to see them on stage. Uh, and once recording and Hollywood kicked in, then you could also hear them in films, or you could you could hear them um, uh, on cylinders or on, on phonograph. How, how have you organized the covers between this northern room? Like, are we in the north room and the south room over there? What's what uh, what divides these? How is it divided up? Let's say that it's a fierce battle between these two rooms. They really don't like each other. Um, Separate them with the hall. They're okay, it's, basically. It's true. It's the Tupac room and the Biggie room. Mm-hmm. And we... Um, <laughs> the the only, I'd say, main difference here is that the, the, this this North room kind of sets up some of the big narrative stories. Um, and the South room uh, is a bit more experimental in its design uh, and is meant to, to kind of focus both on the power of place, the place of downtown. So we have a really uh, um, incredible uh, blow-up of photographic images of Broadway in the early part of the 20th century showcasing um, the extent to which downtown and Broadway in particular was a kind of mainstream of L.A. music and entertainment from the library's photo collection, um, as well as photographs of the piano rehearsal rooms, which was something that I, I actually only learned about at the end of the project, sadly, um, but that in the, in the 1920s, uh, the LA Public Library had a series of what they called piano rehearsal rooms where you could come in and sit uh, at an upright piano uh, surrounded by uh, stacks of, and drawers full of sheet music. And you check out sheet music and you play it in were the room. Were they popular? The, the rooms? Yeah. Yes, absolutely were popular. Um, and especially popular with professional musicians uh, who could come in and try things out. The difference today is only that there aren't those rooms anymore. But I keep, through this project, have met countless musicians, especially classical ones, who will tell me a version of this story that when they're rehearsing a piece or trying to work on a piece, and they'll look everywhere else and they can't find a piece of sheet music, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, as they put it to me, this is their last, re- last resort. This is where they can be pretty much pretty confident that they will robust collection here robust collection and always in use and that's something that the librarians will tell you um with great confidence that this is a collection that has not been covered in cobwebs and dust it's something that has always been in use there are a hundred thousand pieces of sheet music uh and you know they don't share the data on who checks it out and all that kind of stuff but it's a collection that is always in use um in different ways over the decades for sure um, but it's, it's something that's, that, that, that's always been a kind of living part of the city. Mm. Now, what should we look at next in this northern room? I, you know, my eyes go right to sure. that Greater Los Angeles yes. March. I saw it when you posted it on the blog oh, initially, yeah. but it's striking to me because it's kind of... I mean, there's an Arcadian element. There's the palm trees in the foreground, but it's downtown, and yes. it looks kind of like downtown now. I mean, obviously fewer buildings, but not... It's How many downtown shots did you really see on these covers? There weren't actually on these, and the covers in the collection, there aren't that many downtown shots. There's a few, but this is certainly a great one. Uh, and this, this is actually the latest um, piece in the collection. This is from uh, the early 60s, um, I believe. 1964. 1964. Um, and to me, it's just a striking example of what the other songs um, on the wall uh, are all part of this story of, you know, pretty much since the late 1800s, people in Los Angeles have loved writing songs about Los Angeles Mm -hmm. just in the way that, you know, people who live in L.A. love to write novels about L.A., um, love to talk about L.A. Talking about L.A. is part of what it means to live in L.A. How did your fascination begin with Los Angeles? You're from here, right? I'm from here. um, Born. Not everybody from here is fascinated by here. So how did you get to the other side of that pond? Um, I think because I've always... It was music. Um, So I've always been interested in music ever since I was very little. And, you know, I think it became clear to me at a young age that that one can't um, fall in love with and be fascinated by both the magic and the cultural power of music without grappling with its relationship to place. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't come from nowhere. No music comes from nowhere. Exactly. And it shapes 
the places that it fills. And I think very, even unconsciously early on for me, um, you know, because of L.A.'s geography, because of its, uh, uh, you know, quote-unquote sprawl, um, I think it is safe to say that, that, that it's a city that has different kinds of layers of segregation mm-hmm. geographically. And one of the things that, of course, crosses those lines better than most is music. Um, and songs allowed me as a young kid to imagine parts of the city that I hadn't been to yet. Mm-hmm. Um, my geography was pretty limited growing up. I grew up on the west side of L.A. It was what, pretty- are some songs that, what are some places songs told you about remotely in that way? Or what songs took you what places in well, those certainly, days? Certainly, you know, I learned about uh, South Los Angeles through hip-hop. I learned about East Los Angeles through uh, Mexican-American R&B and rock and roll. Um, And like all popular music, it transports us. It takes us and helps us imagine places. Now, it's not about saying these are authentic representations of a place. They become part of our individual imagination. It's still myth-making, like the Arcadian California. Just like, you know, um, like a Beach Boys song for people not only in Los Angeles, but from you know, all over the country, imagined this, 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 this good vibrations, California girls paradise, um, allegedly constructed by beach-loving surfers, and Brian Wilson was afraid of the water. Right, it wasn't his life. No, it wasn't his life. In fact, it was a life of, of kind of bordering on terror in some ways. And, and, you know, it was, as Mike Davis, of course, has famously, you know, you know, written about it. I mean, it was, we don't get the noir side all too often of the California fiction. Um, and so for me growing up, music and place... Um, was was something that I, I, I keyed into pretty quickly, um, and not just LA itself, but LA's connection to other cities, the connections to cities like, take uh, like a Palm Springs or to northern Mexico. Um, that 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 music satellites around exactly them. music reveals the networks and webs um, of cultural places. Now I can't help but call attention to the bear hugging the state of California, the song I Love You California, because as you've written about, it's also used on Best Coast's most recent album, one, uh, I, yes. uh, one of their albums. Yeah. Uh, in some sense, this, this bear hugging California brings boosterism up to our time. You can sort of, you can see the thread, can't you, in that? I mean, that's not the only, it's not just the bear, right? You can, there's other connections with many of these, I would imagine. That's maybe the most overt? Well, it's certainly most overt. I mean, that image was reproduced um, without the accompanying sheet music text on the Best Coast record, um, the only place, if I'm remembering it correctly. Um, and, you know, but this song is such a great example. This is, this is the course, the California State song that is, is about not just Southern California, but Central and Northern California, and the, the Sierras, and the et cetera, et cetera, the Redwoods. Uh, and I had always heard it that way. Um, but in fact, when we found the sheet music in the collection and I started to do just the basic amount of research on it, um, you know, this is a song born not just in L.A., but in downtown Los Angeles. Right. It was co-written uh, by um, someone who owns a clothing store, Francis Silverwood, um, and uh, with the musical director of the Orpheum Theater. So two guys who were working within blocks of each other in downtown, one who was a clothing guy, one who was a music guy, um, and together they wrote this song. Um, and then on the, the actually the first version of the sheet music that, that we found in the collection was not the bear hugging, um, but was the one on the right here featuring Mary Garden, then a very famous opera Another singer. Design, same song. Same song um, with her um, with, with a kind of headshot of her busting through the uh-huh. sheet music. And what we don't see in the exhibit um, is on the back of the sheet music there's a reproduction of a letter that allegedly Mary Garden wrote talking about um, how much she loved this song. And what's great is it's written on Hotel Alexandria stationery. Oh, really? Wow. So there's this kind of nexus of, of uh, you know, Orpheum, Silverwood's clothing store, the Hotel Alexandria. Um, and, you know, it was used to sell California. And now the song, ironically, um, is being used not to sell California, but to sell uh, Jeep Grand Cherokees. Yes, yes, I saw, I saw when you posted that. You know, we... We're talking about downtown, and we should clarify this. In, in the era of this sheet music, it's not so strange that so much comes out of downtown. Now it's not so strange, but that hasn't always been the case in Los Angeles history, right? It's kind of, we're at, they, they, downtown was at a certain state when this music was coming out, and it is maybe at a similar one now, but between those times, downtown was not so much of an entity, right? Well, that's interesting. It'll be certainly interesting to see with the... the um, intensely changing 
infrastructure of downtown Los Angeles now, what impact that's going to have on cultural production. I don't think we, we know quite yet. Right. Um, but it will be interesting to watch. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think for me, uh, like what I'm imagining with so many other folks, is that when you think about the history of popular music in Los Angeles, the first things you're going to start thinking about tend to be around the 1940s. And so, so often the way that pop music history in L.A. gets told is through the perspective of um, the recorded music recording industry, um, recorded music music industry, um, which was not centered in downtown, but was centered more or less in Hollywood. And so there's this kind of conflation with Hollywood and the music industry that I think has has um, become almost common sense. And so Capital and, Records building. Exactly. Yes, iconic, right? And and that and that covers up a lot of the other histories. And so the more we were looking at the sheet music and looking at where stuff was being published and you know noticing performers and where the sheet music were advertising certain artists, um, it was clear like well no this was this was in fact obviously pre pre Hollywood in both senses of the term of Hollywood um, when downtown was the commercial center of L A. And as a result, it, it makes perfect sense that at the, in the commercial center of L.A. would be the publishing uh, arm of, of you know, the music industry. So, so much of the live performance venues, of the sheet music publishers, of the artists, of the hotels, it was all based downtown. I turn around, what, what have I been missing this whole time by facing the other way, facing east in the northern room? What's, what's behind me? You've been missing palm trees and poppies and oranges. I should, I should move to California. You oh, should. Let me tell you, we can take care of that, you know, that cough you've got. It's really great. Here's what ails you. Yes, just sitting out in the sun without any sunscreen, and you're just going to be so healthy. Right. That's, I mean, that's what the songs would convince me of, wouldn't they? That's right. That's, you what, know? that's the matter. How, how, I guess it was, how much can we chalk up to the songs? Obviously, Los Angeles boomed. We know that. Yes. What role did... Can we isolate what role songs... You can't isolate, but can, what, how can we see the effect of the songs themselves? It's a great question, one that we ask the whole time. I, I have no empirical data about you know, someone who is convinced to move because of a tune. Um, but certainly the, the kind of boosterish um, language of natural promise mm. that we not only you know, see in, in uh, civic tourism, but in real estate, mm. um, uh, souvenirs... In um, in locomotive advertising in the citrus industry, mm-hmm. sheet music seems to be not not all of it, but a large part of it seemed to feed into that engine mm-hmm. uh, of you know we didn't find very many songs. In fact, I can't even think of one that goes into detail in terms of a, some, even even the vaguest of critiques of Los Angeles. There's no City of Quartz song <laughs> in know. like 1910. No. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. No, there isn't. There isn't. The only thing in the book. Uh, for this project 
that we talk about a bit is that there was, a, and this is actually a Northern California song, but one of the earliest California songs was a kind of blues about coming to California um, with thinking you're going to discover gold and paradise and the guy ends up broken with a cold. That so, old story. Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of, uh, it's either an old Jewish comedy bit or, 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 or a blues song. But um, So there's a few, but most of it is really peppy stuff mm. either peppy or dreamy mm. um, but th- at the end of the day most of the songs are kind of um, you know are trafficking in a romantic version either of the present day Los Angeles of the 20s or 30s or a romantic version of the Southern California past mm. well, shall we cross the hallway here and check out the um, south yes. room let's do that and I see we're coming up. You come straight on to this giant black and white photo. Yes. What era are we seeing here of downtown Los Angeles? So this is, this is a shot uh, overlooking Broadway on uh, downtown L.A. Um, in, uh, in the 1920s. Um, and it's just, when I look at it now and even think about it compared to driving down Broadway now, it's just crazy to see. You've got the Tower Theater. Mm-hmm. You've got the Southern California Music Company. Uh, with double advertising, side of the building and banner, you know, down the front. Um, you've, and, and they're selling Baldwin pianos, which have a huge sign on top of the building. Then there's the Wurlitzer building, the Rialto Theater, the Platt Music Company, the Orpheum Theater, all within a single block. Right. Entertainment. You, you wouldn't have to leave this block for a while. Right. I mean, it has that feeling in some ways of what um, we, we more stereotypically think of as New York, as Manhattan, of bustling, um, you know, multiple Broadway district uh, theaters on one block where you can see a performance, then go buy the sheet music, then go buy the piano to play that sheet music. That's the model? That's the model, without, without leaving this, this street. Mm. What do we have? We have more sheet music covers, and what, what's, some important, what's an important one or two to highlight for somebody passing through this exhibit when sure. they're at the library? Well, one of the things that, as we were going through the collection, was very clear that the booster history and the boosterism of Los Angeles through sheet music um, you know, covered up the realities of the history of L.A. and Southern California uh, and wanted listeners and performers and fans um, to buy into a version of Los Angeles that simply wasn't true, um, that elided um, the realities, let's say, of um, the Mexican past in L.A. um, and the Mexican present in Los Angeles um, and the African-American history of Los Angeles. And so we we wanted to make sure to include um, sheet music that revealed these kind of alternative stories uh, that were often... Um, completely rejected or ignored by dominant booster histories. So not all the sheet music whitewashed Los Angeles. No. Uh, and so, now there weren't, I would say comparatively, there, there wasn't as much um, uh, African American published and written sheet music. Um, There's an abundance of Mexican and so called um, Old California or Spanish songs, uh, which was also a very convenient way to. Um, a de-Mexicanized Mexican music and Mexican culture. Think of the old sign on El Coyote, Spanish food. Exactly right. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. All part of the, you know, what uh, uh, Carrie McWilliams famously called the kind of Spanish fantasy, fantasy heritage of Los Angeles. <laughs> you know, the Ramona mission myth, um, both the myth of the, of the missions, but also the kind of romance of the Mexican rancho. Um, and so we have sheet music that tries to get viewers to think about that a little bit. So you know, two pieces that um, maybe we could I could mention really quickly is you know one song that's very well known when the swallows come back to Capistrano, yes, one of the great romantic pop songs. Learned about it from Looney Tunes at a young age. Yeah, that's right. All about a mission, um, which in fact wasn't really about a mission at all, um, but was written by uh, an African American songwriter, Leon Rene, who came from Louisiana to L.A., became a prominent songwriter and music publisher. And it was, um, you know, he had heard the story of the Swallows coming back to, you know, to the mission, um, but was, as the legend has it, um, uh, having breakfast with his wife and, um, in their kitchen uh, in Los Angeles, and he was anxious that his food hadn't shown up on his table yet. And so he said to her, uh, when am I getting breakfast when the Swallows come back to Capistrano? And that became the song. Sort of a domestic argument was yes. the basis of all this? Yes, that produces this, this song that is now under glass 
at the mission on display. It's the humble beginnings. Yes. <laughs> if we turn around, I see we've got more sheet music and other photographs as well. So, what if, what's what's the what, what's represented on these sides of the wall? So this is um, a gallery of sheet music here um, that focuses on specific places. So what we often found throughout the collection, and, and just to you know emphasize, these are just small examples of a, a, we could we could change out this sheet music um, for years to come. There's a lot Will of different Will there be any examples. changing out here, or is it fixed? We talked about it. I mean, I think that's something that we're thinking about down the road. It's not up to me. Um, see. We'll see, see, it, see it now goes. in case they change it, so you can that's see it again. Right. Good. It, it's going to change. <laughs> come on down. Change um, come. Yes. Um, and so individual places, like the Mission Inn um, in Riverside, the Paris Inn restaurant, um, the, um, the, the birthplace of the singing waiter, Ooh. Thank goodness. Um, you know, sheet music about Long Beach, uh, specifically Long Beach hotels, the Hotel Virginia, the Maryland Hotel in Pasadena, the uh, Barker Brothers uh, Furniture Store um, uh, has a song there. Uh, and so a lot of sheet music went from either California as a theme, Los Angeles as a theme, but also was very specific. It was about this hotel. It was about this restaurant. It was about this place. Could I'm trying, since you, you obviously came into this knowing a lot about Los Angeles, what's something that, digging through the project of no doubt a long time spent digging through these archives, sorting, yes. figuring out what's what in the, in the world of Los Angeles sheet music of this one century, what, what has it taught you about Los Angeles you didn't know before? I'd say one of the more um, specific stories that I knew nothing about actually has to do with these two pieces right here, Doris Akers. Um, two songs by Akers. She was um, an African American woman who was really a kind of pioneer in gospel music publishing. Um, and she came out to Los Angeles and started her own music publishing company um, located on Central Avenue. Um, and finding sheet music in the collection that had a Central Avenue address that were clearly gospel songs. And then, the, and I knew, I, I confess that I did not know about her and did not, and she's a very, very well known gospel uh, songwriter. Her songs were sung by Mahalia Jackson, and she was a recording artist in her own right. I think learning about these, these histories of uh, songwriters and publishers who have kind of been sidelined by dominant stories of L.A. pop music history, that's where these objects can, can almost have a kind of um, subversive, um, uh, rattling quality to them. And they can kind of shake up your view of what was happening in 1955. It wasn't just this song. It was that song and another one. And it wasn't just this community. It was multiple communities. That sense for me kept returning, that just when you think you have the narrative, you don't. Now, in the span of time covered by Songs in the Key of Los Angeles, you've got the music industry going from selling these things, selling scores with elaborately designed covers, to selling recordings, physical recordings with elaborately designed covers. And now we're watching it move on to the next thing. Whatever it is it's going to sell, it'll be something. It won't be what we've bought before. And Los Angeles as well, we mentioned, you know, there's, there were certain commercial centers during this period. They shifted after this period. And now they're shifting again. I mean, is there some analogy here between the shape changing in the music industry and the shape changing of this city? It seems like they both, at the same time, went through their, went through their metamorphoses. Metamorphoses? I don't know what the word is. Sure, the downloadable city. Is yes, that, that, yes, that, that book is we're, we're one to be written. written. Yes, work on it. It's a good one. <laughs> it's a good title. Um, I, I think that's a really, really, really provocative uh, idea. I think that all I can say at this point is is that you know cultural production uh, and urban identity or cultural production and urban infrastructure uh, are always have always been linked in cities across the world um, you know in in some cases the cultural production or the musical production prophecies uh, the shape a city is going to take in other cases um, the city determines the sounds I mean that's something that I kept thinking about a lot in this is you know was it um, the Beach Boys who, you know, was it the beach that created the Beach Boys or was it the Beach Boys who created the beach? Oh, yes. um, was it NWA um, who created, invented Compton or did, or did a different Compton invent NWA? Um, that's a, I'm fascinated by that relationship between an urban environment and its cultural output. Um, What's interesting is that, of course, sheet music is now coming back. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's kind of these analog objects are coming back in digital form. There's 
multiple iPad apps for sheet music. Books like yours? Mine, but and more importantly, Beck's book, uh, you know, book that was, instead of putting out an album last year, he put out a book of sheet music for people to play. More people are playing music now as amateurs um, than, you know, from the past few decades. There's a return to a kind of amateur public music culture um, without corporate monopoly that in a way is an echo of the 19-teens and early 1920s. Does that mean the city is going to go back to um, no traffic and uncongested streets? I don't think so. Uh, and and we, traffic sucked in the 30s. Yes. yes. And, and we also don't want to get into the trap of, of a kind of romantic nostalgia um, for natural or unspoiled Los Angeles that, has a, you know, that comes with a lot of, of, of racial and ethnic baggage to it. But certainly I think by listening to the songs of a city, we can get a, get a very strong sense of where the city is going to go next. Finally, listeners can see uh, Songs in the Key of Los Angeles' website. They can come to this exhibit where we stand in the downtown library. They can buy the book. They can. There's recordings they can get. There's performances they can go to. What, what, should, they, what should they do to fully experience this whole project? Um, I think the first thing to do would be to visit the website of the Los Angeles Public Library uh, where the Southern California Sheet Music uh, Archive is represented there uh, with some sample images of covers, um, but also a series of new recordings that we made um, uh, with the generous support of Bedrock Studios um, where you can hear five songs uh, in a contemporary version. Um, And then also see the Sheet Music Collection in dialogue with the other visual collections of the LA Public Library, the photo collections, the menu collections, all of which are so incredible and inspiring and impressive. And that's where this project, this is where it, be, it's where it begins and where it ultimately lives. This is a project that is born out of the desire of the um, head of the Library Foundation, Ken Brecker, um, to mine the collections of the library and to see to, to, to honor the work um, of, of preserving all these collections uh, while at the same time um, interpreting them and bringing them to life um, and telling new stories about them in ways that we haven't yet experienced. So I'd start there. I'd come hear this music played out loud. Um, the, the, the finale concert will be August 2nd with Oza Motley and lots of special guests. Um, and, and I'd just, you know, come to the library. Come to the library, go to the music library, um, and uh, check out some songbooks and check out some music. uh, And best of all, go home and play it. I've been speaking with Josh Kuhn, professor at USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism and the curator, co-curator of Songs in the Key of Los Angeles. Josh, thanks so much. Thank you, Colin. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I'm Colin Marshall. Stay with us. More to come. Café Caliente here in the heart of Los Angeles, California, Olvera Street. Let's start the party. Cuando bailan, todos cantan, como cantan las chapanecas. When your heart is light, then your step is bright. Take your partner's hand and swing her. Welcome back to the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. We are still downtown at the Central Library, continuing our special, shall we say, on a Songs in the Key of Los Angeles, the new exhibition and book and series of performances and recordings and more. I'm speaking now with city librarian John Sabo. John, tell me, why is this, what's important to you about this exhibit and about all the rest of the things I just mentioned? Well, and it's exactly that. There's so many different um, 
uh, elements to this, what is a celebration of the library's uh, collection. Uh, and it is an amazing collection, a very well-used collection in Los Angeles. And this incredible project uh, sponsored by our library foundation and led by the amazing Josh Kuhn uh, is uh, really a wonderful way to let Angelinos and people beyond Los Angeles know about the special collections of our library. And uh, this this project takes so many different uh, directions. It is the performance of this music. Just this weekend, we listened to uh, a wonderful performance of several of the songs in the book and that are part of this exhibit. And, and being able to listen to the sheet music of our library come alive on stage, mm-hmm. uh, and in many cases, songs being performed for the first time in decades, mm-hmm. is really a, a beautiful thing and leads to... Uh, other ideas and uh, uh, creative ideas on how other parts of our collection might be able to be celebrated. Uh, and also it's about Los Angeles, and I'm new to Los Angeles. I've uh, mm. been here 11 months, and so it's it's personally been a wonderful way for me to connect to the city and the city's history. When did you become aware of the, the, the wealth that the sheet music collection had? I mean, when when did it... When, when did it strike you that there was a, something really to be worked with there? Soon after I arrived, I learned about uh, this collection and the many wonderful collections here at the Central Library and at our branch libraries as well. Uh, and this this project to uh, take the sheet music and really uh, celebrate its art, celebrate the history, uh, bring it forward uh, for the first time. Uh, and um, it, it's certainly about scholarship. It's about the history of our city. Uh, it's about performance. And it's it's the first of what I hope will be many projects that will bring collections to the to the front. I want to hear a little bit about your impressions of Los Angeles, of what it takes, what it would take, what did you think for you personally it would take to get a handle on the culture here? I mean, this is just one example of the ways to do that. Songs in the Key of Los Angeles, but it's a, it's a big undertaking. You know, what was, to your mind, the way to the way to get a grasp on what the culture is here? Well, it's certainly going to take longer than 11 months. Yes, no doubt. I mean... <laughs> But it's been a wonderful 11 months exploring yes. L.A. And, and this project has been a, a, really a, a wonderful part of that. You know, the, what, a lot of what this project is about and, and what these songs are about is discovering Los Angeles and, and sort of being a, Los Angeles as a beacon for people and people reimagining themselves and uh, the advertising and, and uh, excitement of place. And not just about Los Angeles, but these songs really are about the American West. And as I explore the places uh, in and around L.A. that uh, these specific songs uh, talk about, the Pasadena and the Palos Verdes Peninsula and the San Fernando Valley and Avalon and you know, Catalina Island and all, it's, um, it's been really incredibly exciting. It's What's perfect. something revealed to you by these songs about Los Angeles? What's uh, something that you've just been surprised by how the artwork in the sheet music interprets uh, Los Angeles mm-hmm. as place. You know, one of the uh, I think interesting things is is just sort of the stylized images. The one one of uh, of the songs uh, about Pasadena uh, paints this very tropical place with palm trees and sailboats and water in the background, <laughs> which is <laughs> fascinating given Pasadena's. Uh, Given its location. location. Yes, uh, but it's a lovely, uh, yeah. lovely cover there to that sheet music and uh, the cultural representations in the, in the artwork uh, uh, as well. Hmm. Now, coming from a city like Atlanta with a very different history, what, what do you think about, what does it say about a place like Los Angeles that it's, you go back a, not that long in the grand scheme and just find it built on so much pure boosterism. And that's a, that's a, a nice way to, to phrase it. L.A. to me has really struck me uh, since I've been here as a place where all good ideas find fertile ground uh, in some way. And uh, initiatives and ideas and innovation and creativity here is not bounded by having to be rooted in some past construct or past mm-hmm. history or uh, and and I think that's a, a very special thing about about Los Angeles. I've been reading a lot about the uh, LA art scene in the 60s and moving on into the early 70s and that's very much what was so popular about LA as a place where artists from the East Coast and and local artists really found found their place here and found a uh, a, a place where their art could really be 
celebrated and, and uh, gain acclaim. What does it take to put on a, I say exhibition, but a multimodal, multi-platform project like Songs in the Key of Los Angeles? What did this require? Well, it takes a lot of wonderful people on our library staff with the Library Foundation and certainly Josh Kuhn and, and the people that he has been able to bring to the table to, to make this happen. Uh, musicians, artists, nonprofit partners. Uh, but you know, quite honestly, it, it hasn't been this huge, hard, difficult <laughs> ordeal. It's, it's, it's something that everyone understands the importance of. Everyone has jumped on board and gets behind it. And it's, it's been easy to make a lot of this happen because people are so enthusiastic about it. And people, I think people yearn for ways to connect with L.A.'s history and L.A.'s past. And I think there needs to be more of that. And being able to do it in such a creative way uh, is is really wonderful, and the way that this has brought in such a diverse array of musicians and uh, individuals has been fantastic. And the idea that that the music is not just the sheet music is not just framed and on right. a gallery wall or indexed and properly made available by by librarians, but that it's it's being performed and, and discovered uh, for the first time. Somehow we yearn to be free of the past, yet also yearn to connect with it at the same time here. Absolutely, and I, there, there's an interesting relationship that LA has with its history and with its with its past, and I think uh, w- ways in which the library can be a place that helps people connect with that history, but also help the various diverse neighborhoods of the city uh, connect uh, and be part of um, you know a, a broader theme is really wonderful. The library plays a very special role in that regard, I believe. How do you see? the library as a facilitator of connection. People write about Los Angeles and say things like, it's an impossible place to connect one part to another. Even in terms of driving around, it's it's been difficult. Well, it's it's hard to imagine an institution in the city that I think has a better chance at at doing that and to, to making progress in that space. You know, the there are so many advantages to the public library in that regard. Uh, certainly our physical presence, 73 locations throughout the city. Um, you know, we're in all of the neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Uh, but the public library, and as the public library has been for over 100 years, is an institution that stretches out its arms and, and welcomes everyone and, and does so in a very genuine way. And so I think in that respect, uh, because we are an institution that doesn't just serve this audience or that audience, uh, I think we have the opportunity to to, to bring people together through uh, cultural programming, through having taking advantage of the library's presence in those communities and really having an understanding of what the issues are in those communities and being able to, to, to bring communities together. You know, we work a lot in the space of citizenship now, and uh, that's been a, a wonderful way to have the library and position the library in a place where we can really um, help with a, a significant need in L.A. It feels like, it feels to me that the sheet music in Songs in the Key of Los Angeles, you know, even these boosterist songwriters, even the ones who, shall we say, wanted to play down the diversity of Los Angeles in those days, they understood that variety and in some diversity in some sense was the strength here, did they not? Well, I think that's an interesting topic to look at as we look at the sheet music and how that diversity uh, is is portrayed. Clearly, I think there's that recognition that you, that you spoke about, but um, I, I think it, it it it's exciting and makes me think about what the collecting opportunities are going forward, and mm. and and the importance of ensuring that our collecting in our traditional collections as well as our special collections not only includes that diversity, but broadcasts it and puts our our institutional arms around that that diversity uh, because it's something that's amazingly important and and critical here in in LA and uh, you know I I I worry about you know lost histories and I think the library plays a big role in telling stories and telling stories of those those neighborhoods and those communities uh and so I I think it speaks more to going forward the importance of ensuring that our collections uh, and all of our services and our programs and our events reflect that diversity. What what sort of history do we run the risk of not collecting or forgetting right now, do you think? Well, I think, you know, one of the significant roles of the public library going forward is gonna, going to be 
uh, sort of a local history archiving role. I think the technology and um, the opportunity to uh, discover e-content in a variety of, uh, you know, whether it's video, audio, print, digitized documents, uh, there's an incredible opportunity to preserve uh, organizational histories, neighborhood histories, mm-hmm. personal histories, family histories, in a way that we've never had the opportunity to, to do before. Mm-hmm. And so you think about Little Ethiopia or Little Bangladesh or uh, Porter Ranch or some other area of our city. Um, I think the library can help to tell those stories and help with digitization and uh, really being a, a memory institution for Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Now, you've come, it seems, at an interesting time to the city for this because, I don't know, I've only been here a few years myself, but I get the sense that now, in, let's say, the early 21st century, there's this new wave of interest in the history of Los Angeles and in preserving the present as the future history it will be. I don't know. Do you get that sense as well, that there is just this this current going on as well as any individual institutions' uh, progress in, in keeping the history around and in looking back as well? The enthusiasm for this project certainly speaks to, mm-hmm. to that interest and uh, people sort of having hunger for, you know, L.A. is so often about new yes, <laughs> and about sir. innovation and about reimagining and about what what is out there in front of us. Yeah. And uh, so I think there, there is that hunger. But I think in L.A., in telling these stories and in uh, exhibiting that history and performing that history, I think uh, it's, it's important that we lean on the creative community here to help tell that story in, in new and interesting ways. There is a vast community to tap into there. And, you know, there's a vast archive of sheet music people might not have known about that they're going to find out about now. What else don't we know about that the library has uh, at its fingertips? I mean, is is there some other big archive that there may be plans to make a show out of or that you'd like to see uh, brought to life in the same way? Well, what, what, uh, what, what, what are all your secrets, I guess? Are they, what are you holding in secret here in the library? Not so secret, because this wasn't secret, but what, peop- what don't people know about? Well, that's true. And, and our special collections are well utilized, and they've been well, well utilized for, for many years. But the idea of uh, uncovering some of those collections and, and advertising them, marketing them, promoting them, and helping a, a bigger audience and a new, uh, new audiences know about them is really wonderful. There are lots mm. of examples of what you're talking about in the collections here uh, at the library, and actually some special collections here and there in our branch libraries as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, One that immediately comes to mind, and of course all of us at the library and library foundation are thinking about, and the wheels are turning about what the next project is going to be. Uh, One of those collections that I think uh, really lends itself to this kind of uh, treatment is our menu collection. Uh, we menu have collection? Menu. Restaurant menu. Restaurant menus. <laughs> we have uh, over 8,500 restaurant menus that uh, the librarians of the Los Angeles Public Library for decades have collected uh, that date back to the 19th century. How did they, how did you get them? How and why? And in all sorts of ways. Well, we're the home for uh, a group of Southern California culinary historians. Mm-hmm. They have been wonderful at helping to build that collection. Uh, our library staff and working with restaurants have, and there was a time when people just uh, knew of the collection being here and, and would, mm-hmm. would give their menus, and we've been able to acquire some collections of menus uh, over the years as well, so it is built to this uh, fairly notable size. Uh, but the ideas on how we might I- exhibit these menus, which many of which are really beautiful, and the artwork of the menus mm-hmm. is wonderful, but also how we might engage uh, local chefs, restaurants, uh, to... Uh, reinterpret uh, these m- menus and uh, the dishes on these menus. I think there are all sorts of uh, really great ideas and uh, mm-hmm. opportunities to to talk about the the culinary past of LA. There's there's a lot more culture to be revealed by those than say, hey, look, cherry pie used to be seventy five cents. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and. Uh, uh, just the history of restaurants in LA and uh, d- cuisine and, and the growth in the, the food scene in, in Los Angeles over the years. And we talk about revealing elements of Los Angeles culture. I want to know when you first got here yourself, what, what did you feel like you needed to know or should know about this place? Just, just as a newcomer, not even as the city librarian, just as somebody new in town, what felt like it needed to be 
clarified to you about Los Angeles? One of the things I was curious about, and coming from Atlanta, an, another Olympic city, and, and a, a diverse city as well, um, in, in a different sense than L.A., is I, I heard a great deal about and certainly know a great deal about how uh, Los Angeles has such great pride in its its diversity and uh, um, the, the background of the people in, in this city. And I, I was most interested in how people talk about that diversity and how, peop- how that diversity manifests itself uh, in uh, conversations, organizations, art. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think that just in my 11 months here, I think that the library can really uh, play a wonderful role, as we talked about earlier, about uh, connecting communities and um, bringing cultures beyond the boundaries of particular neighborhoods. One of the things you hear a lot about is as proud as L.A. is of its diversity, it still can be a very segregated city. With um, and, and So I think there are wonderful ways the library can do that through our programming, our collections, the services that we provide. I want to hear a little more about what you what you learned from paying attention to how people regarded diversity. I mean, obviously that pride, obviously... Well, the diversity is sometimes hard to get to, you know. There's that sense that it's not walled off, but there's some lack of connection sometimes. What else did you notice in the way diversity was regarded here? The celebrations of that diversity too often happen only in communities, uh, uh, in in individual communities and neighborhoods. Right, they're Uh, they're where that particular group is, they celebrate it there and maybe nowhere else. Absolutely. I mean, it's important that when we celebrate um, uh, African American history or when we celebrate uh, LGBT pride, that we we do it um, in, a, in a big, uh, broad way across, across the city. Mm-hmm. And in, in, in some instances, it's almost more important that we give attention to and focus on uh, celebrating it in geographies where that that population isn't uh, so predominant, and uh, because the library is truly the most democratic institution, I think, uh, in, in our community and certainly in our nation, and it's important that we embody that always and all the time. Now we should underscore here when uh, when a listener goes to buy the book, songs in the key of Los Angeles, or a recording, or whatever contribution they make, it, it benefits who? Uh, it certainly benefits uh, the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, and it, that is a wonderful nonprofit organization that exists solely and exclusively to support uh, the library, public libraries of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Public Library, and mm-hmm. for which we're incredibly grateful. Uh, and also, just that book being out there, uh, representing the collections of our library is a, a wonderful gift to the library, just in terms of helping more people know about it, know about us, and know about what we have to offer here. And it's a, a, a teaser, in, in a way, of all of the other great things that we have. Anything that we can do to, whether it's the exhibit downstairs or a performance, to bring people uh, into our uh, physical doors or through our virtual doors uh, through our web presence at lapl.org, uh, they're always going to connect to something else that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to connect to a lapse at story time or English uh, language conversation classes, adult literacy programs, uh, all of the rich collections that we offer both virtually and in print. Mm-hmm. Uh, so great things happen when, when we're able to have exciting exhibits like that. And finally, I want to know this because we were downstairs doing the tour in the previous segment with uh, with Josh Kuhn. She, he was showing me all of the glorious Arcadian scenes of Los Angeles on these sheet music covers and all the ways, all the, the things, the benefits these songs promised you. If you move to Los Angeles, oh, this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. Life will be good. Uh, all your problems will go away. I want to know how much of a sense you got of Los Angeles still being boosted before you came here. Is it still a place with the same attitude surrounding it. And and where did you choose to live in Los Angeles when you came here? Oh, I'm still choosing. The oh, Los- yes. I'm exploring. I, and, you know, visiting our libraries is a wonderful way to learn the city and to learn neighborhoods and to help make that decision about uh, the, the, the place to live. So that decision still hasn't been made yet. But how, how would you avoid choosing where to live 11 well, months in? Well, I've been to 41 of our libraries. I've got 32 left to go. So... Uh, still, uh, still looking for for uh, for a home, but um, 
Absolutely. You know, I think that that enthusiasm, that that boosterism is absolutely still there. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is a still a great uh, excitement and pride in this city. Uh, and uh, I think I only see that, that growing. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, it, it's wonderful to be a part of. And it's so important for the public library to be a part of that as well. Mm-hmm. Every great city has a great library. I've been speaking here in the downtown library, the Central Library in Los Angeles, with John Sabo. He is the city librarian. John, thanks so much. Thanks so much. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can find more from me at colinmarshall.org, and you can find more from LARB at lareviewofbooks.org. Thanks. Come love the moonlight is shining bright.